I would like to honor and acknowledge that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuits, and Metans. I recognize I'm grateful for the legacy of all the past, present, and future generations of the First People of this land. I join you from uh, Toronto today, which is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize the work done by the nine Indigenous Institutes in this province. Uh, the Indigenous Institutes are a key pillar of Ontario's post-secondary ecosystem. And as a member of this sector, I want to recognize and share their incredible leadership for Indigenous owned and led education. Uh, please learn more about them with the additional links my colleague will be sharing in the chat soon with you. Okay, so a little bit about me. I'm sure that a few of you in the chat already know, but uh, my name is Monica and I am the Digital Transformation Associate in the Research and Foresight team at eCampus Ontario, and where I work primarily on running the leadership for digital transformation micro-credential and also the DX community of practice. I have been supporting, if I talk about my work, I've been supporting digital learning in various roles for, let's say, around 15 years now. And I also have my manager, Laura, and other team members from eCampus Ontario joining us today to ensure the smooth running of the session. And it gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce our presenters for today. So. I am delighted, I'm genuinely delighted to introduce our amazing speakers for this session. Our first presenter for today is Alyssa. Uh, she is currently a research and foresight associate at eCampus Ontario. Uh, previously, she has worked in a variety of sales, accounting management, and organizational process design roles in the private sector. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts from McGill University, a postgraduate certificate in human resource from the University of Toronto, and a master of design and strategic foresight and innovation from OCAD University. Uh, well, a fun fact about her is that she has been a student at four post-secondary institution, uh, institutions and three of which were in Ontario. Our second presenter for today is Rocio, currently a research and foresight associate at eCampus Ontario. She has spent her professional career researching innovation in education in Canada and Mexico. Uh, she holds a Master's of Design in Strategic Foresight and Innovation from OCAD University and a Bachelor's Degree in Pedagogy from Universidad Pan Americana Rosia, I hope I got the pronunciation a little correct. Uh, a fun fact about her is that she ended up doing her foresight masters in Canada as opposed to Australia, partly because a documentary on the wildlife of Australian cities scared her or scared her off. And you know, she was coming from the concrete jungles of Mexico, uh, is what she says. So we are so, so happy to have you both uh, with us here today. Uh, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, for those who are new to eCampus Ontario, just to give you a little overview. eCampus is a provincially funded nonprofit organization that leads a consortium of the province's publicly funded colleges, universities, and indigenous institutes to advance the use of educational technology and digital learning environments. Our membership includes 53 institutions in this province. Our members are faculty, administrators, uh, student support services, uh, registrar's office, uh, basically anyone. We welcome anyone who's involved in post-secondary education in Ontario to come find the right opportunity for, for them uh, while working with us. Uh, so this uh, just a little bit of when we think about digital transformation. So we all know that digital transformation is, is far more than simply, you know, you adopt a new technology or you support online education. When we say digital technology, we are actually trying to find the tools uh, that can help transform an institution's operations, strategic directions and value proposition. 
So here at eCampus, we are committed to fostering digital transformation in the province's higher education sector. And how do we do that? We provide digital by design platforms, programs, and services that are responsive to shifts and opportunities in the educational and employment landscape. That said, we understand that DX is not like a straightforward journey, and then there are challenges, and we need to discuss those challenges and identify the solutions. And so one of the objectives while we created this DX community of service was to have a platform where you know we all could get together and have meaningful conversations around digital transformation in higher education. So for the remainder of today's webinar, we will hear from Ellis and Rocio, who will take us through the amazing work done by the Research and Foresight team, focusing on how we can improve flexibility in post-secondary education. So over to you, Alyssa and Rocio, and I shall stop talking now. Thanks, Monica. Uh, we're gonna just flip to the next slide. So uh, my name is Elisa Arnold, as uh, Monica said, I am part of the research and foresight team. And I am uh, going to walk you through first the agenda of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the research and foresight team at eCampus. A little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about the context, um, the research context that informed uh, the research we did, what the background was, the framework. We're going to explore the um, what educators think about flexibility, uh, wh what educate how educators feel about flexibility, and what educators' visions, aspirational visions uh, for the future are, and possible pathways to achieve those visions. We're going to have some discussion, and we're going to talk about what's next. Um, next slide. So in 2021, eCampus Ontario launched a research and foresight unit to support the post-secondary education sector, help navigate uh, digital transformation, and also to build a shared language to explore and uh, co-design co the futures of post-secondary education. Uh, through research and foresight, uh, eCampus Ontario helps to strengthen and support the sector's ability to anticipate potential disruptions and prepare for digital by design educational futures. So we do that by exploring uh, data and information. We look for emerging trends and opportunities, and we work to co-design future possibilities. And we do that with the intention of affecting uh, change, uh, creating impact and affecting change, uh, particularly, though not exclusively, uh, related to digital transformation. And uh, we, uh, we aim to support strategic action in this context. Next slide. So part of the work of our team is to do uh, what might be considered traditional research. We do project scoping, literature reviews, environmental scans. We create uh, research instruments like surveys, um, and we conduct mixed method research uh, on topics, whether they are um, brought to us externally from the sector or elsewhere, or perhaps sometimes it's generated internally at eCampus. Uh, in addition, we conduct ongoing scanning of what's going on in education in the province, in Canada, as well as globally. And our team is also tasked with uh, organizational evaluation. So uh, we, uh, we monitor what eCampus Ontario's impact is, uh, whether it be through our products or programs. And um, an example of that is we track uh, the impact of the virtual learning strategy, which some of you may be familiar with. Next slide. Uh, in addition, uh, Rocio and I are trained specifically in um, foresight. And so in addition to traditional research methods, we also apply foresight methods. So 
what is foresight? Um, at eCampus, when we speak about foresight, we're referring to a methodology which uses a particular way of thinking about the future. Marie Conway is a pioneering foresight practitioner from Australia where there are snakes, Rocio. And she defines foresight as the capacity to think systematically about the future uh, to inform decision-making today. And at eCampus, we support the development of these skills uh, and it's also a mindset and we support this development for individuals, organizations, and we do post a lot of things publicly to support uh, the broader society around foresight skill development. Next slide. So you may be thinking uh, foresight is something that I do like as you, as the listener, as a human being, you might be like, I practice foresight all the time. And that's correct, you do. It is an innate human skill uh, that allows us to plan for the future. And we all do plan for the future. Uh, generally speaking, in the work environment, people use foresight uh, and think about the future when engaging with a strategic planning process, a budget planning process, and uh, sometimes the output of that might be something like an organizational strategy. Um, when, and when we do this, traditionally, we're kind of thinking three to five years out. Uh, we're looking often when we engage in traditional planning processes to uh, like establish certainty. We're looking, how can we, how can we be as certain as possible about the future? And, you know, the the kind of the output of this process is, you know, we take a goal and we turn it into a formal documented process that has action steps that we measure. So that's often how we apply foresight sort of intuitively in an organizational context. Next slide. So in the uh, a formal foresight methodology, as perhaps we would use at eCampus, we focus first on uh, broadening the set of variables. So we extend the time frame and we widen the information considered. So looking at the visual on this slide, you can see that it, the uh, end of the cone has all those dots. So those are more, more expanded set of variables. And we might look you know, 15, 20 years out into the future as a, as a concept to consider when planning. In addition to expanding the variables, a core component of foresight is to explore assumptions and, and biases uh, within that particular project. You know, what happens if you change the assumption? What happens if you test the assumption that sometimes lays beneath the explicit conversation when planning. And one of the expect expectations, um, and one of the assumptions that we would explore when planning is this desire for certainty. Is that even achievable? We would say probably not. So how, how can we work within a, a, a future planning process where we can't establish certainty? So, we would go through this we go through this process broadening the variables broadening the time frame and then the last step is the step that we're already familiar with which is we do take the broader set of data and possibilities and apply them to a goal and turn it into a formal documented set of action steps that can be implemented and evaluated However, because we have now expanded the variables we've expanded and explored the possibilities there's a greater preparedness and flexibility should there be a need to adjust the plan, which is generally speaking uh, necessary because things change in the environment. In addition to sort of that broad, broad stroke, quick introduction to foresight methodology, very specifically at eCampus Ontario, we uh, integrate uh, several characteristics into our approach as a department. And one of those is to be collaborative. So we believe that multiple perspectives are necessary to uh, have a robust exploration of the future. And you'll see that our offerings are 
executed cross-functionally and involve the participation of as many people as we can integrate into any project. And we believe every perspective is valuable. Um, our approach is participatory. Uh, we assume that the people who are involved in a problem should participate in addressing the problem. And we believe that foresight can be used to move towards a preferred future rather than simply mitigating risk in the future. We want to build a future we want rather than just avoid uh, a future we don't want. Uh, we are multidisciplinary. We uh, leverage expertise across our team and at eCampus e Ontario. Uh, we work with instructional designers, project managers, historians, political scientists, librarians, and more in order to uh, capture a variety of perspectives and domain expertise. And we wish to improve equity and fairness. So we, um, Rocio and I, uh, myself, recognize that the history of foresight um, has been used, in history, foresight has been used as a methodology to promote inequity. And we are committed to integrating approaches with the intention to decolonize both the process and outcomes, um, as well as the intention to improve equity and fairness uh, in, in the use of the method. So, that is a little bit about us. I'm gonna pass it over to Rocio uh, to talk about the research specifically. Of course, if I would unmute myself. Thank you so much, Elisa. Uh, so now on to the specific research project that uh, you all signed up because you're interested in exploring flexibility in post-secondary education. Uh, so first of all, why did we focus on flexibility? It is no news to anyone here that the COVID-19 pandemic forced a level of, let's call it emergency flexibility, never seen before in the sector to support the continuity of different functions of the post-secondary institutions. So as we find ourselves emer emerging from uh, that situation and going back to refiguring out what's next, how do we continue and how do we deal with now other situations that are coming into the sector? What does flexibility look like? Uh, additionally, the foresight research we conducted over the past two years, which considered like Lisa was talking about those broader time frame, broader variables uh, to explore the possibilities. All of our findings reflected an underlying need for flexibility as a key characteristic of the sector if we want to achieve agility in response to major drivers of change. Uh, so we wanted to explore what a flexible by design post-secondary education, education system might mean. Uh, and especially for educators as the key stakeholders at the forefront of transformation and implementing change. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, what were those major trends and patterns that we found uh, that reflect an underlying need for flexibility? Uh, they include expanded access for education, which includes the increasing recognition of learning acquired outside of established formal education, growing pressures to drive social impact from post-secondary education and from institutions uh, and more diverse learning communities influencing different models for education and learner engagement. It also includes the expanded availability of free content in learners' ubiquitous digital lives uh, that is reshaping completely their expectation of what learning resources, content, and platforms can and should look like. Um, also, no need to talk about, with the, especially with the current news, the rising cost of living and education is changing the perceptions about the value of post-secondary education and the different elements of value, the expectations of learners, and forcing re-evaluation of the post-secondary education financial models. Uh, we also spotted an increasing development and integration of emerging technologies, of course, uh, including but not limited to artificial intelligence, mixed realities, and Web 3.0, paired with the growth of informal learning environments, which is uh, challenging the established teaching methods and environments. And finally, alternative ways of validating learner learning, such as those found in gaming and blockchain technologies, could provide alternative ways of validating 
accumulating knowledge. So for post-secondary to act on these converging factors and enable better features, preferable features, we need flexibility as a sector characteristic that can yield to agility and sustainable transformation. But what does all that mean to educators at the forefront? So next slide, please. We launched a call uh, for participation to instructors in te teaching at post-secondary institutions. So we had uh, in total 45 instructors participating in over six workshops with strategic foresight methodologies, uh, 29 taught at publicly assisted colleges and 16 taught at publicly assisted universities. So for starters, it is important to know that the insights that we will present today are only reflective of the college and universities uh, context, not indigenous institutes. Um, next slide, please. So what did they say? Uh, let's start with why they consider flexibility important. Um, indeed, educators perceive flexibility as a non-negotiable after the pandemic. They view it as a key to ensure the sustainability of the sector by enabling adjustments to both economics under pressure and technological advancement and social changes. And they also see it as uh, foundational to address equity gaps and properly support diversity in the sector and to meet learner expectations. Next slide, please. So when we discussed flexibility, what did we even mean by flexibility? How were educators framing flexibility? Definitions were very broad and varied. They definitely extended from just flexible delivery modes, which is usually what dominates the conversation. Uh, their framing uh, was mostly as an adjective of practice, infrastructure, and policy. And for the purposes of this research, we defined policy as um, including actual policy, but also anything related to frameworks, structures, guidelines, and requirements. So we kind of have that expanded understanding of, of policy. Um, framings of flexible practice by educators included having room for them to experiment, iterate, learn with a balanced approach to collaboration, but also autonomy to choose the best methods and tools for them and their students. Uh, definitions of flexible infrastructure refer to digital environments, physical environments, and hybrid environments. And it mainly referred to having the space and systems to access new tools, but also to having established and effective processes for curation and selection of those tools to make the appropriate decisions. And finally, framings of flexible, flexible policy included um, the need to iterate on different funding models and operational structures in an explorative way to support new ways of teaching, learning, enrollment, and assessment. Um, and when framing flexibility, next slide, please, educators also noted some critical contradictions or tensions within uh, the framing. Some of them, they pointed out some of the benefits of flexibility can also create further challenges for flexibility in other areas. Uh, and some of the factors enabling flexibility could also constrain it in other areas. So they mentioned that these are some areas where uh, there needs to be further work and exploration done to properly address them uh, and establish uh, workable workable uh, strategies. So for example, with regards to diversity and personalization, educators mentioned that flexible supports help meet diverse students' needs and expectations, but it also creates the need for them to have additional professional development resources and tools to be able to adequately support those diverse ways of engage, engaging. Uh, they also mentioned that flexible pathways to education where people can have multiple entry points and exit points into the system can facilitate meeting learners where they're at and enabling learning at uh, when they need it most. But they recognize that it also imposes a challenge or forces the rethinking of part-time, full-time working, ways of working that needs to be figured out. Um, additionally, they mentioned that flexible modalities allow learners to access education anytime, anywhere, making it viable for them to work, learn, and live at home. 
This, they mentioned, could alleviate some of the financial burden of having to move and live on their own or in expensive city centers and also help them balance education with work and family. However, they also mentioned that in these online environments, they can also feel frustrated about the perceived lack of learner engagement in this online format and the expectations of having to be available 24 seven. So clear boundaries need to be established to also address educators' own work-life balance. With regards to interactive tools and resources, uh, educators also mentioned the tension or contradiction uh, where flexible online environments have inspired them to integrate more interactive tools and resources to create different ways of engagement and in learning and create a vast library of resources. However, they also mentioned that they can quickly become overwhelmed with the options and that they don't always have the adequate time to test properly these new tools. And finally, they also mentioned a critical tension, which is flexible teaching practices, uh, challenge traditional assessment methods, and allow room for more authentic methods, which they're excited about and supportive of. Uh, but they said that there needs to be more agile update of policies that guide these new ways of assess assessing while maintaining academic integrity. So this is a summary of how educators frame flexibility, the problems, the opportunities. But now I will turn it back to Elisa to also talk about how educators feel about flexibility. Thanks, Rocio. So uh, Rocio has explored uh, what educators told us they thought, uh, but to have the full dimension of uh, educators' experience of flexibility, we also wanted to understand how educators feel. Uh, it's our perspective that sometimes uh, our culture focuses on thinking over feeling. However, uh, understanding how people are feeling can provide added insight uh, because first of all, thinking and feeling are interconnected and inform each other. And also understanding how uh, people, educators in this case, are feeling can sometimes reveal pathways as well as obstacles to change. Um, so it, by, uh, by illuminating how educators might be feeling, uh, we uh, think this could help improve the success of any strategic plan that is uh, actualized in connection with uh, flexibility. Next slide, there it is. So what is the uh, educator's experience of flexibility? What, it, what are all the, how did the feelings kind of fit together? And we, um, we carved out motivation as its own space related to feelings, but maybe a little distinct. And uh, when we looked at motivations, what educators expressed as their motivation uh, was the desire to create equity and address diverse needs. That was one key motivator. And educators were also motivated to meet learners' expectations. Now, learner expectations are, uh, as defined by educators in our, our research, was very expansive and included delivery modality, different cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds, learning needs, accessibility, and life stages. So that's what educators expressed as their motivations. And now connected to these motivations are how educators are feeling. And the motivations of the group we spoke with were straightforward and fairly um, consistent. The feelings expressed were more complicated, and many of these feelings could be categorized as uncomfortable. Uh, the rate of change and lack of confidence in meeting the changing and expanded learner expectations were connected to educator feelings of uncertainty and overwhelm. Uh, the ability to uh, achieve their motivation of creating equity and diversity and meeting learner expectations was perceived by some educators as outside their control. And as a result, they were feeling powerless and disrespected. 
Um, the evolving role of educators has left some feeling embarrassed as they're not, uh, they feel they're unable to position themselves as an expert in their classroom. Below these feelings um, are held, are the assumptions held by educators we spoke with. Uh, the scope of this project uh, did not include the exploration of these assumptions. So we didn't, um, we didn't, uh, explore them at any depth. However, we did think they were worth noting for two reasons. Uh, one was these assumptions are foundational to the feelings and motivations, and often people hold these assumptions deeply, uh, sometimes unconsciously. And second, there was a variation in educator points of view on these assumptions. Like for example, some educators expressed the assumption that flexibility was decreasing the quality of Ontario post-secondary education, and others felt it was improving the quality. So deeply held at the base of the feelings, but uh, different perspectives. Um, there were also differing assumptions about the purpose of post-secondary education, um, as well as differing assumptions about the role of money in post-secondary education. And these were expressed during our research. So exploring these foundational assumptions is key. Um, and this is sort of the first step in, in, uh, in, in that exploration. Next slide. So we also asked educators about what they want for the future and how they think we might achieve these aspirate, ap aspirational futures. Next slide. So in general, educators in, in our research envisioned a future where they are the leaders. They are the center of their students' experience. And they described a future where the educator is like a conductor coordinating various team members, or in the analogy, their orchestra. Um, but the, the educators establish the environment and make the decisions. So the educators aspire to a future where the various learner needs are addressed, on all learners feel like they belong. Um, they described a future with enhanced collaboration, with technology specialists, designers, curriculum support people, as well as industry, co-designing with learners and other educators. Um, and in fact, collaboration with educator colleagues uh, specifically was explored and, uh, and there was a future described where global collaboration became much more common, uh, both in person as well as with technologically enabled environments. Uh, there was a discussion around the integration of technology that's not yet mainstream in education, uh, like a more expanded integration of artificial reality and virtual reality, um, and a reconsideration of the physical space to accommodate these new technologies. So what path might we take to achieve these future visions? Um, educators in our research suggested revisiting a number of areas in our current models. So for example, uh, time allocation uh, to be reconsidered to incorporate more time to innovate, practice and try out different ways of teaching. Um, educators pointed to reconsidering the current resource and funding models to provide for smaller class sizes and educator upskilling. Uh, educators indicated a reevaluation of working arrangements. Um, they said that that would pretty much be needed to create many of these envisioned futures. And finally, uh, reconsideration of traditional practice, practice standards related to professional development and career pathing and how educators are assessed and evaluated in their role. And the uh, last point was that all these changes the uh, to enable these futures, the uh, as they are reconsidered, that the expectation that continued flexibility will be needed should be built into these new standards, these new understanding, for example, of time allocation, with the expectation that maybe five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, we will need to adjust again so that the that whatever is established as the next thing should have some flexibility already 
um, built into its its like essence. And with that, I hand it back to Rocio. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so the primary overarching goal of this project was to explore the idea of flexibility from an educator's perspective and from multiple angles, inherited past, present day situations, future visions and motivations, uh, considering the personal experiences, hearsay, so to speak, what they're seeing in their sector, what they're sharing with the sector, um, how people think, feel, believe, uh, to create a multifaceted model of what flexibility is. So with this research, we have mapped a starting model of flexibility in Ontario's post-secondary system, um, understood that it has helped us understand some critical challenges, opportunities, and possible ways forward. Uh, and capturing the voices of the 45 participating educators was definitely critical to spot some of these challenges, opportunities, and possible ways forward that we can collaborate on as a sector. However, we also note and recognize that this is an incomplete perspective. Um, we also need to understand and unpack the perspectives of other key stakeholders in the system. For example, educators in indigenous institutes, members of the sector, administrators, learners, industry and government. How do they understand flexibility? Where is the alignment? Where do they defer and why? And having this collective understanding will allow us to shape nested series of change from a multi-stakeholder, multi-level perspective that can help us create conditions for a shared vision and coordinated action to improve flexibility in the sector. However, uh, from this starting research, what are some key takeaway questions that we uh, are taking from this? Uh, for starters, how can we facilitate agile and large scale dialogue for sharing and gaining consensus in a complex and rapidly changing topic? How can we explore an ex novation strategy that makes room in terms of time, effort and resources for scalable innovation and experimentation? How can we facilitate a forum for ongoing multi-stakeholder collaboration with a bias towards action? Let's try actions, let's see the impact, let's make change and drive change. Uh, and how can we support agile shared and safe spaces for experimentation and iteration? So these are some of the further exploratory questions that we take from uh, these insights. But we are also so grateful that you have all joined this webinar and we're also interested in what you think about this. Um, so I invite you now, next slide, please. Um, please go to the chat and share with us how are the ideas and information presented to the to today connected to what do we all what you already know? We're interested in what resonates with you or what is affirming what you have already seen or heard. Um, so how is this connected to what you already know? If you can tell us in the chat. Okay, I see uh, some of you resonate with the iceberg model. Okay. Those conflicting different layers of motivations, feelings, assumptions, and uh, definitely the contradiction. It's such a complex matter that we definitely saw diversity and contradiction between what a group of educators said, but also when exploring it personally, there's so much contradiction. And it's interesting to explore what that layered influence means. Is there anything else that connects? Okay, next slide, please. Uh, what about how does this extend your thinking about flexibility in post secondary education? Uh, what new ideas did you get from this that broadened your thinking or extended it in different directions? And this might be ideas that it made you think about, something that you reconsidered or something that you found that you hadn't maybe thought of before. How did this extend, how does this extend your thinking about flexibility? 
Rosie, I can see that there are a few comments regarding your first question. Okay, chat. so how does this connect? Feels like a race to get the next winning idea within a context that it's ever evolving and wanting collaboration at the same time. Uh, that's definitely one of the critical areas that we spotted and it's part of our takeaway questions. How can we facilitate and collaborate as a sector in solving these common challenges that we have while also allowing for the differences uh, of, of each institution? Uh, and the differences of the demographics, goals, sectors that each one of them has. Um, I see so three spheres of flexibility. Okay, that extended your thinking, policy, infrastructure, and yes, practice that. Uh, yeah, so that was interesting because we went into this research thinking about flexibility in we usually talk about flex, high flex delivery modes, the ability for the student to choose, but it definitely expanded our understanding of it. So having that practice infrastructure policy model in place can also help us understand how to target our actions. Uh, oh, you popped this comment in the Q&A and I see nothing in the Q&A. So thank you for reposting it. Um, I've spent the last few days conducting an analysis of the AODA uh, PSE guidelines, strong language regarding predictability and teaching, caution with jumping on emerging technologies and consistency. Um, that is a really good point, and that is partly what was expressed in the need for further time to experiment whether with different teaching methods or technologies before implementing to facilitate uh, experiment, uh, to facilitate flexibility, because those experiments need to include what are the implications for different needs uh, with educators, with students, what are the accessibility needs, and we need to make sure we meet those requirements before launching into constant unpredictable change uh, for students. So it makes those shared spaces for agile, timely experimentation even more important. Um, PSE guidelines also like for extra time for students to learn the new tools. Completely true. So we need to, how do we build in those time slots that educators need to experiment on the back end, to try to figure out what it needs and to ensure all the needs are met for our students. And then on the other end, how do we make sure uh, we have the time and spaces for students to go through, through that change uh, process and adaptation process with new learning techniques. Um, okay, so final question for you. Thank you for sharing those uh, thoughts. I now invite you to tell us, we're also curious about what challenges you. What about this information challenges or what puzzles emerge for you? What further questions do you have, doubts? Uh, like we frame them for their questions for exploration. Uh, Yes, so the important balance in experimentation frameworks so that they, as much as they can be an area of excitement, they shouldn't be a stressor. And we refer back to also those comments about the, the feelings of overwhelm. On one end, educators recognize that they have been working on and they are excited to integrate different technologies to support flexibility, but at the same time, that task can be overwhelming. And it can be the same thing for the learner as the learner tries to navigate different ways of engage, engaging in their classes and their learning opportunities. If we have way too much diversity, way too much experimentations, it can also become overwhelming. Uh, which also led us to the question of like, what do we need to let go of or decrease or face out to face something else in. And that's what we're calling an ex innovation strategy. So that is one of the areas that we're curious about exploring. How do we combine this innovation structures, as experimentation structures with uh, exploration of ex innovation strategies? Um, for the connections, the simple piece of collegiality, people saying, hey, Here's where, how I can help collaborate and maybe challenge assumptions about money, time, expertise with my learning community. Absolutely. Uh, and it is one of the critical 
points, how do we facilitate those mechanisms for collegiality within institutions and across institutions? Um, support when senior administrators disagree with common sense. Also that uh, note on facilitating multi-stakeholder, multi-level dialogue to share the different perspectives, different experiences and reach consensus uh, to move forward. Um, also the good note by Christina, the level of flexibility that we might want to integrate might not necessarily be met by our learners. Uh, the importance of facilitating and improving our learners' digital lear literacy, which will in turn help them engage better in different online learning environments. Uh, there's actually, if one of my colleagues can post a link here, eCamps Ontario has recognizing the importance of this work on digital fluency and digital literacy, they have been doing some work on resources to support educators in uh, developing the lit digital literacy of their students. So if um, we can have a second to, one of my colleagues can post the link uh, for you. There, Alex just posted it on the chat. So please refer to that because definitely an important area for work. Um, Another challenge is we need to appreciate the need for educators to experiment with technologies to have improved flexibility and encourage new approaches. Um, it can also contradict processes for tech accessibility, privacy reviews, resources to support adoption and the use, the reality of budget cuts, which is exactly uh, that totally resonates with what was also expressed by educators in our workshops. And that's why we developed that integrated model of practice infrastructure and policy because we will not get very far if we do changes in practices of flexibility, experimentation, uh, technology selection, whatever, if we don't improve also and re-explore what we included in that uh, framing of policy for our research, which includes all of this, all of the processes for procurement, for budget setting. So we need to be exploring those areas in tandem uh, to actually enable further transformation and, and impactful, meaningful change. Um, I think I've captured it all. So th this is a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, we have about five more minutes for questions. So if there's any other questions that you have uh, about what we shared today, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, Rocio, we did have we've... one. Yes. Oh. We did have one in the Q&A. Um, okay. Someone, if you could just remind them, uh, remind everybody briefly of how we came to define flexibility for this research. Um, I will link them to the slides with the Venn diagram as well. Uh, yes, absolutely. So what we uncovered is the definition is actually more complex. So what we came uh, to was a three-way framing of flexibility, using it as an adjective for flexible practice, flexible infrastructure, and flexible policy that yields to agility and sustainable transformation in teaching and learning practices, infrastructure, and policy. I just want to add that when we started this research, we thought we were going to, our hypothesis was we would emerge with flexibility as a noun, that we would have flexibility is a thing. And we would be able to, we were trying to come up with sort of like a broad application as a result of the synthesis of what educators told us. That's kind of our hypothesis going into the work. But what actually came about was it was an adjective for many things, a flexible delivery model, a flexible way of working, a flexible mindset, a flex, like flexibility was applied to as an adjective rather than being a noun. So it's more like how could it be a lens through which we consider many things? It's where we kind of came out from it. I don't know if that I have I have trouble explaining that concept. So I don't know how clearly that came through, but that's where that's where we landed ultimately. Thanks, Elisa. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for sharing your thoughts and questions. We hope you found this interesting. Um, 
So just some notes on next steps. All of this insights and more will be published in a series of briefs, which will be available in March and our research and foresight website at eCampus Ontario, um, which the link I will share in the chat right now. So there is where uh, in March, you will see the briefs available for your further analysis. And also you'll notice if you scroll to the bottom of that website, uh, you have a space where you can submit ideas to explore other features. If there's other topics that you're interested uh, that you think as a sector, we should explore to re-envision and explore future possibilities into uh, for post-secondary education in Ontario, please feel free to submit those ideas. We will be more than happy to consider them. And if you submit those ideas, you will be part of our mailing list. Uh, so if you're part of our mailing list, we will make sure that once the briefs are published, we will send them directly to your inbox. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I will now pass it on to Laura for some closing thoughts. Okay. And yeah. Well, Monica, sorry. <laughs> no, no, this will be a fun surprise for everyone. So unbeknown <laughs> to Monica, I asked Elisa and Rocio if I could have five minutes or less sure. than five minutes at the end of our webinar, really to recognize, thank you so much, Elisa and Rocio, but to recognize the incredible work that Monica's done. Uh, this is our last community of practice for, for this cycle of community of practices. And Monica has been absolutely instrumental in organizing our community of practices, organizing the leadership for digital transformation, micro-credential, and the proof is in the feedback that we have been receiving from her learners. I mean, at eCampus Ontario, of course, we are supporting our educators in the province, but we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge the amazing contributions of our own staff uh, to building a program from scratch and bringing it out into the sector. And yesterday was Monica's birthday. So, I mean, <laughs> it's just a great time for it all. Uh, but that's it for me. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you for everything. And I will share uh, that as of today, we have reached over 200 participants in this these five communities of practice. So very well done to you. Wow. So, you know, that's that's the, 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 the crux of the REF team. We love surprises. We give surprises. So <laughs> trust me, this was a surprise. Thank you so much for the kind words, Laura. I mean, it, it's always about team. Uh, and to all the participants, you know, uh, I mean, this does conclude our webinar, and I would like to thank Alyssa and Rocio for sharing all the amazing work done by the research and foresight team. I was so engrossed that I was like, oh, I have to move forward also. Stop listening, Monica. You also have to do our work. So thank you for that, and thank you to our amazing audience. I know uh, quite a few of you were there who are also the part of the program. Thank you for your kind words. I hope you have found this information useful. We will be sharing the recording uh, with all of you once it's ready. And last but certainly not the least, uh, thank you to the ecom, uh, the communication team, and for everybody else from eCampus who was there here today to make this webinar, you know, a success. Uh, if you would like to find more about our professional development program and all the amazing work that my research and foresight team does, uh, you can reach us at research at eCampus Ontario. Uh, at eCampus Ontario and you can explore and you know as I just said there's a lot of other things that we are doing at eCampus Ontario do visit our websites you know you will have a lot of information about the different ways that we are continuously making an effort to support you in your digital transformation journey and on that note it's been an absolute absolute pleasure having you all here today Thank you again and have a great day, a great rest of the day. Thank you so much for attending the session.